is it over? Yeah. And, and that's really the driving question when you when you approach the, the and how study would you know? of exile. That's, that's another related question. How would we know if it is or isn't? <laughs> well, it, it was fascinating to me um, how many people answered the question historically without defining the exile. Oh. Uh, and so the way I approach it in, in, in my argument is differentiating between um, the question of the duration mm-hmm. of exile and then the prior, logically prior question of the characterization of it. What, mm-hmm. How do we define the thing? Mm-hmm. What's the exile? So many people don't come at it from, now to your question, Camden, yeah. a canonical perspective, mm-hmm. um, or, or even, let's use another term for the same thing, the final form of the scriptures mm-hmm. as we receive them. Um, so many people have a historical presupposition and say, by definition, uh, the historical event of the exile or exiles is what produced the idea. So the theology is preceded by the history. And so when we're talking about a theology of exile, we begin with Assyria or Babylon. And for some reason, the Babylonian exile is like the sun pulling everybody's attention with its gra- with its gravitational force. There's very little discussion about Assyria, which is why people miss the the continuing exile of the ten tribes and that kind of thing. But my question, and, and this is philosophical and hermeneutical, and I have a feeling, hat tip, that this is why you like my approach, uh, is that the theology itself predates the history of the northern and southern exiles. God Almighty did this for a reason. He allowed it. The book of Deuteronomy prophesies that God's people are going to break his covenant. And because they do that, they're going to forfeit the land of rest that he gave them in covenant. And so we have this this idea of a triangle between God, people, and land. Uh, And when the covenant is ruptured, every connection between those three points of the triangle gets ruptured, gets damaged. You forfeit the land. Um, and you forfeit God's holy presence in it. And so uh, my approach of make, taking the radical assumption that Deuteronomy was prior to the Assyrian and Babylonian exiles. <laughs> um, yeah, say that again, because some people <laughs> might not realize how radical that view is in the wider scholarship, right? Yeah. Uh, Most people think that Deuteronomy would be written. Listeners to yeah. the Reform Forum, by and large, probably assume that Moses wrote Deuteronomy yeah. and that he did so before 722 BC. Uh, but in the wider New Testament world, in the world of biblical scholarship and especially mm-hmm. critical scholarship, yes. uh, we have to recognize that people believe that that history has to shape theology, that theology does not shape history. And so we have to find the event that, precipita- that precipitated the theological development. Well, those events would be the historical exiles of to Assyria and Babylon. So whatever a theology of exile is, it it wasn't Moses who wrote these ideas, or at least whatever got handed down was radically adapted to reflect that. And I, and I just thought that that was not a necessary assumption. So let's see what the Bible has to say for itself in its canonical form. And lo and behold, there are powerful, consistent covenantal reasons why God's people of Israel would forfeit their land. Mm-hmm. And it says so right there in Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy yes. 32. and The covenant curses, et cetera. How do you think about this, Will, as an Old Testament professor and someone with a lot of expertise in prophets, which is the massive theme here? We see that yeah. the Lord's yeah, yeah. covenant lawyers come in to prosecute cases. <laughs> yeah, so that's the important part. If the prophets are... As clearly different ways client. to think about them, but if that's they one are aspect, yeah. engaging in this sort of prophetic lawsuit, then they have to have the covenant document to instigate the lawsuit from. Mm-hmm. And, and that would, of course, be Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so without Deuteronomy, the whole prophetic witness starts to fall apart. And so that's going to be you know, a significant part of that. But also to, to David's point, just so that everyone knows, most Old Testament scholars would say something like, Deuteronomy is coming about the time of Josiah, you know, king in, in, in Judah. So we're talking, you know, most will associate it with the law book found, and they put quotations on it, uh, in the temple, right? And, and so they, tying it in with the history that David's talking about here, see it as kind of a political propaganda piece written for Josiah's religious reforms. And, and so with, you know, Josiah's dates about 640 to 610, 
uh, BC, then the 722 exile of the Northern Kingdom would have been right on the horizon uh, for that. And, and so that would be the precipitating idea for exile, according to the critical construction uh, of it. But as David's saying, and as the Bible presents for us, it's actually the exact opposite. Deuteronomy doesn't come up as the reproduction of a political atmosphere after the historical events. It provides the covenant foundation for the history that's going to be worked out. And this, you know, tying it in with exile as curse, specifically covenant curse, then the book of Deuteronomy, especially Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 30, provides the categories for us to understand of what's going to happen in the exile. And without it, the exile starts not making sense whatsoever. But also there's a wider context too, canonically, that you develop significantly with those Adamic themes. We start to see that that exile isn't just turn, you know, arising out of covenantal terms in, in Deuteronomy, but even has certain biblical, theological, necessary preconditions in, in God's relation to Adam, correct? Yeah, that's exactly, mm-hmm. exactly right. It's fascinating that as we look at the passages that Will just mentioned, Deuteronomy 28, especially Deuteronomy 32, which is the Song of Moses, uh, the refrain of why the Lord gives Moses the song is so that when they fall and when they are in the land, they will already have the answer as to why. Hmm. Uh, And throughout Deuteronomy 32, but not just there, but all throughout the books of Moses, and again and again across the scriptures, Israel is framed as the son of God. Uh, The the famous reference is Exodus 4, verse 22. Moses shows up to to Pharaoh and, and he says, let my people go. And the reason from the Lord that he was supposed to let them go is because Israel is my firstborn son. And throughout all the book of Exodus, it's first person singular masculine pronouns Mm -hmm. that describe Israel. It's no longer this unborn group of random people out there. Actually, from the very beginning of the book of Exodus, um, they are inheriting the mantle of Adam, the son of God, who was made in God's image and who then passed his own image onto his son Seth in Genesis 5. Adam was the son of God, reflecting the image of God. And then at the very beginning of, beginning of Exodus, we see that Israel was fruitful and multiplied mm-hmm. in the land of Egypt. And then they're called God's firstborn son. And then they, the personified, let's call them the typological son of God, right. get, begin to be treated as a corporate unit that God wants to deliver. And he promises his son Israel a very similar thing to what he promised his son Adam, a land of rest and blessing in God's presence. That's what the promised land is. It's a reflection. It's a type of Eden itself. Um, And it's fascinating as we compare Israel and Adam, just how much God's behavior towards them uh, echoes. Uh, There's patterns to develop as we see God treating Israel like he treated Adam. And it's a promise of restoration. Uh, I'm going to bring my son back into fellowship with me in a land of plenty and rest. He's going to undo the exile of Adam, and he's going to do it through Israel. 